There's always a bull market somewhere, but some are harder to find than others. Kramer is heeding the call. Go west, young man. Among the rubble of the tech sector torn asunder, Mad Money takes you to the heart of Silicon Valley to hammer out a San Francisco strategy. And we start right now. My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to a special West Coast edition of Mad Money. I'll be able to make friends. Just trying to make you some money. My job is not just to entertain, but to educate and teach you. So call me at 1-800-743-CBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. When you take a good hard look at this market and really probe into its guts, there's one thing coursing through the body, and that's disappointment. It has an inevitability to it. You know it. I know it. The inevitability of disappointment is true even on a not terrible day like this one, Dow advanced 16 points, S&P inched up 0.31%, NASDAQ gained 0.40%, perhaps because it was much higher earlier in the day. Now, that's that pattern, that sickening pattern. Every year, we like to come out to San Francisco to rediscover what makes this economy work. But this time, there's a vicious sense of disappointment looming almost everywhere. The first disappointment is the stocks themselves. When they start out strong, there's a pretty good chance they'll give up the ghost by midday. If you don't follow the market that closely, you may not realize that the leaders this morning were none other than the semiconductors. There were buyers all over the place as early as 5 a.m., especially for AMD and NVIDIA, a pair of chip makers that used to be much higher, although they rebounded hard off their lows lately. After Friday's pacing, it seemed like a pretty good entry point for the group. So AMD stock opens up a couple of bucks, and it's anointed the leader because that's a big analyst meeting on Thursday. Just like solving a crime, you have motive, the analyst meeting, means, the money on the sidelines, opportunity. It's only a couple of bucks. Let's go. Next thing you know, the prince becomes the pauper. AMD plummets, and you're down three from the highs. It's almost like you're playing baseball, and you're up comfortably, and then suddenly you let up four runs, and you want to know who did it to you. Every one of these declines feels like a personal affront. It's impossible not to take this market personally. Second disappointment. Again, not the company, but the stock, Apple. You know they're holding a big worldwide developers conference filled with terrific ideas like buy now, pay later, which for Apple is revolutionary. They have virtually no defaults on Apple Pay, and I bet they'll have the fewest on uh, Apple Pay later. It's a real challenge to the entire buy now, pay later industry. Then they redo their sports app, and it's incredible. So it's a challenge to all the current sports apps. To me, these changes are seismic. But to the raging bears, no, no, just a yawn. Sell, 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 sell. A non-needle mover, a disappointment. How is this possible? Anyone who really follows Apple knows this pay later thing is gigantic. But the bears tell us it's incremental, not revolutionary. The company gets zero benefit in the doubt, and the buyers are swamped by the sellers. It's like there's a highway patrol officer saying, nothing to see here, keep moving, cutting the rubber, rubbernecking buyers at the carotid artery. The Apple analysts have chosen not to downgrade or cut numbers, although I'm thinking that's really just out of deference. They just want to spoil a worldwide developer party. But once this conference is over, I'm, I got to believe it's going to be let the downgrades begin. It's a truly vicious market designed to fake out as many people as possible, including anyone who bought Apple at the high because of these changes. Yes, I think they do move the needle collectively, but individually, I get it. They bring out sellers before a late-day move that staunches the losses, brings the stock back up slightly, but not again to where the buyers were at the beginning of the session. It teases you. Third source of disappointment, Elon Musk. I mean, last week he knocked down the entire market when he said he had to lay off people at Tesla, 10% of their salary workforce, because he has a super bad feeling about the economy. Super bad. <laughs> Coming on top of Jamie Hurricane Diamond's ugly comments about the economic weather earlier this week, you got a pair of negative bookends that made Wall Street incredibly nervous. If the man behind the biggest automobile innovation since the Model T thinks that it's time to do some big layoffs at Tesla, what's going to happen to everyone else? And then he comes out on Monday and says he's wrong. And he might even have to do some hiring, making Friday sellers feel like idiots. I think Musk is one of the best people, business people of our time. But I wish he'd run his public statements by a lawyer, or better yet, a phalanx of lawyers. 
When a CEO acknowledges that he's laying people off, that's called material information. So if they turn around and say the opposite a few days later, you got a real disclosure problem. Wait, but that's not all. There's more. Were you buying Twitter because you thought that Elon Musk was buying Twitter? I mean, think again. He says there's a problem with bogus accounts. So now he's not acquiring the darn thing. Even as he agreed to do so after he had actually checked off on the problem earlier. I can't blame him for wanting to back out. I wouldn't want to buy Twitter at the price he agreed upon either. But it is a gut punch for anyone who bet the deal would happen. So Musk says he's laying people off, then he isn't. He tells us he's not buying Twitter for something he previously told Twitter he was fine with, at least implicitly. Now, why are Twitter's pushing for specific performance, a legal term meaning he has to go through with this bid? Look, I love Elon Musk, but I have Elon Ennui. He's become someone who's too mercurial, even for my brain. Then there's some disappointments that lurk and lurk like a subtext underneath everything, like oil. You know we need oil prices to go lower if this market's going to have a sustained advance. So it seems like it's time for the oil stocks to go down. How many days can they go up already? How many weeks can they go up? The sellers, they come in hard. But then buyers come right back later in the day as if nothing happened. Once again, a vicious fake out. My travel trust is incredibly overweighted in oil, precisely because it's been by far the best performer in this terrible market. But I, I'm like a bull in Jellystone National Park. Prices are going higher at the pump, and nobody but the president can do anything about it. And even he can't, can't do all that much. Biden would rather speak to the Saudis about boosting production than go to the Permian Basin in Texas. We're the biggest oil producer. Either way, the lesson is simple. Just get along some oil stocks. Finally, there's a sense of future disappointment to come that I want to give you a little heads up about. The People's Republic of China has decided to clear Didi, the Chinese Uber, in the government's cybersecurity probe. Once again, we have a gigantic move back into Chinese stocks by Americans, as if the Communist Party's last crackdown on these companies was simply one more buying opportunity. How is it possible that this can happen again and again? Who are these money managers who think that Didi's now in the clear and you can go back to all your favorite Chinese names? Their government has proven it will turn on these companies at the drop of a hat. This is the definition of insanity. I was okay with the trade when it's, I saw it coming last week. But if you come in now after this move, it's no longer a trade. It's an investment, and it's a dangerous one. Bottom line, I want to be kind to this market and tell you it's the same old buy-the-dips game plan. But in reality, the only dip that can be bought, right now at least, is the dip in oil. Everything else is, as they now say in a damning way, transactional and nothing more. Let's take some calls. Let's go to Jeff in Colorado. Jeff. Hey, Jim. Booyah. Happy Monday. Yes, same. Hey, I'm calling about Shopify. Uh, I know you've had great things to say about them. You've even had their president on your show a few times. And, uh, heck, you even mentioned your wife uses their platform. Um, oh, yeah. I, I, I know you like them. But we're down, what, 80% from pandemic-level highs. We're trading essentially back at late 2019 levels. And with the current forward P.E. ratio of like close to 300, I'm thinking it's really expensive. It is expensive. Rates. Do you, hey, see you read it right. This? You read it right. Uh, look, in another market, you know, I, look, I think that these guys are fantastic. And yes, we use their product. But here's the problem. We are not buying on this show. We are not buying expensive stocks. We're buying the stocks of companies that make things and do stuff that return some capital and are valued at a reasonable level. And 424 times earnings is not a le reasonable level. Let's go to Jimmy in Kentucky. Jimmy! Hey, Jim. Thanks for all you do for the little man. I was going to ask you a question today. Sure. Uh, Jim, with all the new autos and EVs hitting the markets and fuel sky high, I'm in at 16 with Ford. Do you see, when do you see better days? I think better days, right. I'll tell you, we sold some Ford for the Chapel Trust in the 20s. I am anxious to buy that Ford stock back. Why? They've got the product line that everybody wants. That still matters. These are not just commodities. Ford's got a great product line. The F-150 Lightning is terrific. The Maverick, only three days in stock. That's all they can keep it in stock. The Mach-E, they've got so many things, both internal combustion, but their E lineup is just killing it. So I say Ford is right here with a 3% yield. And it sells at seven times earnings. That's what I'm talking about. I like that. Hey, let's go to Matt in Wisconsin. Matt. Yeah, booyah, Jim. Booyah. Greetings from Wisconsin. Thank you. I got quick questions for you. Uh, I was hoping you'd give me some advice on an investment I made last year. Sure. The investment was with uh, Coinbase, ticker coin. 
I bought it for three hundred dollars a share. Now it's hovering around seventy dollars. Do I sell it or do I ride the storm out? And what does the future hold for Coinbase? Okay, now uh, when Mad Money, we don't care where stock came from. We only care where it's going to. I happen to think that Coinbase is a company that I don't want to affiliate myself with. It's not expensive. But as far as I'm concerned, that market has turned very, very nasty. I've not liked these guys for some time, and I'm not going to change my tune now. All right. The only dip that I think can actually be bought during the day is the dip in oil. Oh, man, money tonight is coming from CNBC's one market in San Francisco. Is now the time for ServiceNow. Extremely profitable. Tech stocks, money, a comeback. Maybe it's right. I'm sitting down with the CEO to find out what's ahead for the company. Is the comeback for real? Then Twilio helps power the communication between you and many of your favorite apps. But stocks down 60% year to date. Our investors speak a different language. I've got the CEO. Plus, is it time to strike on CrowdStrike? I'm sitting down with the CEO after today's upgrade to find out what's next for the company. Three that you might want to buy. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.